Keith Smith, little NBA, Yahoo Sports. So real quick, before we get to Keith, he just tweeted this out. Mm. that uh, Actually, he retweeted that DJ Augustine, Michael Carter-Williams, will not play tonight for the Magic, which means that helps my Fultz bet. What's your bet? Uh, I have Fultz averaging more than 12 points a game. Mm. So 12 or more, I win. 12, uh, less than 12, I lose. Okay. How's he doing so far? I know he's been playing right about lately. 12, but yeah. as Keith Smith has told us the last couple of weeks, his uh, scoring average has gone up, up, up. He's gone up, up, up. So it looks like he's going to get past there, especially with a uh, couple injuries in the backcourt tonight. That'll help me out. He had a good game the other night. Yeah, I saw some of the highlights. Yeah. Good for him, by the way. I mean, I, I've never hated on him. I felt the Sixers did the right thing, but I mean, I, I'm going to overcome yeah. the demons. Well, I'm just hoping him. he's going to win me some money. There you go. <laughs> I don't care. Other than that, I don't care. I just, I'm just, I want to. I had, I put that bet out there with somebody, and then somebody else said, "I'll take that bet." Yeah, no, that's how down people were on him. Oh my god! And I yeah. was like, I will take that. He bet thought from he was him. fleecing you. Exactly. <laughs> and I was like, I'll take the bet from anybody else who wants to get action on it. There's video going around that Mikkel Bridges now has a hitch. Yeah, I saw it. that. I, I watched it, and I did not think that was a hitch. More that he was practicing a. The way you receive the ball or fake and then put mm-hmm. it up. I didn't see that as a hitch, especially since every shot was going in perfectly. I, I did notice that every shot was going in pretty perfectly. Yeah, but I didn't see it as like a like... delay in the shot, more like before the shot. It looked like he was doing a like a quick head fake or a hand fake. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. Okay. Yeah, that's what and I thought. You could I was be going practicing crazy. where you're where you're getting it, how you're like right. You know, bringing it in. Players do that all the time. Okay. All right, let's bring Keith uh, Smith in. Yahoo Sports covers the NBA. We got a lot to get into here as the season is now kind of kicking after that uh, Christmas break. We are starting to look a lot more at it, and he joins us each week at this time of the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Welcome back, Keith. What's going on, bud? Hey, guys. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The football season's winding down, and everybody whose teams are out there turning their eyes to the NBA. So this is when it really gets going. Yeah, and uh, one of the things we've been discussing, you know, the Sixers play the, the Nets tonight, and, you know, obviously we've always got our eyes there. Have you noticed the uh, difference in splits recently in the Sixers shooting? They have a six-game road ru- losing again. And when these things happen, we ask people like you why, and no one really has the legit answer. Maybe they're just not playing well on the road for whatever reason. But when you watch the Sixers road and home, the numbers are really different in a six-game sample recently on the road. Now, if you look at the full season, they actually are a better three-point shooting team on the road than they are at home, which is kind of odd. But uh, when you see the Sixer team kind of struggling on the road the last couple of weeks, uh, what do you make of it? Yeah, I think it, the the only thing that stands out to me, because the numbers there, it, it's just, it's kind of, like you said, they're better for the season overall, but recently they're not playing as well. But the only thing I see is it looks like their communication late in games isn't as good on the road, which you would think makes sense. We're playing in kind of a hostile, loud environment and those kind of things. So that's the only thing that really I've noticed that seems to be different. Um, and they're already not a, a great fourth quarter team. Uh, as offensively, I guess is a better way to put that because defensively they're pretty good. But offensively they struggle some. So I think that tends to be the only thing that stands out to me. I don't, don't know that there's enough in there with the shooting that we can really make a definitive statement either way. All right. So then how difficult is it for an NBA team, a coach, to – constantly go through the roster changes that the Sixers seem to go through in really really hard it's one of the things that the coaches will tell you whether it's a designed situation where you're you're kind of in that rebuild mode where you're cycling guys in and out I know Brett Brown went through that he spoke on that you know quite a bit that it was like a revolving door and and let's not get really used to these guys names get things their names on the back of the jersey kind of thing. And then you have teams that, that the Celtics uh, several years ago, they made more in-season trades than anybody had ever made. And it was about every 10 days they were making a big trade, multi-players coming in and out. And for the coach, that's really hard because the NBA, people think, oh, well, they've had two days off, so there's practice time in there. It doesn't really work that way in the NBA. There's built-in amount of like true off days where players got to be out. And even when you're having those days where it's a practice day, that practice day consists of maybe an hour or two at most in the gym doing something. And then the rest is guys getting treatment, doing their individual workouts, getting in the weight room, those kind of things. So there's just not a lot of time when you get guys in and out because of injuries and those 
those things. That's where really that consistency, it, that, that's probably the single biggest sacrifice you make because guys are hurt and guys, or guys are hurt, guys are playing who don't usually play in those lineups. Just That's when you start at this time of year, you're looking and it's, oh man, that lineup's only played 20 minutes all season together and now tonight they've been out there for 15. And that's the kind of things you get. Now that's really tough on a coach. Keith, I'm curious, whatever your opinion was prior of Joel Embiid and his injury history, does the latest injury change, add, fuel, whatever you thought, uh, do anything to that perception for you? Um, not, not too much. I, I think it was just such a weird thing that happened. It's just one of those basketball injuries where, you know, guys' fingers get bent the wrong way, and the next thing you know, it's uh, – you know, it, it was funny, comical to me that normally you know, I've jammed fingers before and I, I just played. Well, yeah, your finger got jammed. It wasn't pointing the wrong direction and <laughs> hanging off your hand. But I think for Joel Embiid, it's just every once in a while we get these guys who come through the league that are incredibly talented. And then you look back and it's like, man, that guy was always hurt. There was always something. And I think at this point, no matter who you are right now, it's Philadelphia. You get to look at it and say, yeah, Joel Embiid, I just I can probably only count on this guy maybe 60 games is what I'm going to get out of him. And you, you build it and say, all right, if that's what we're going to get out of him, we're going to get 60 probably really, really good games out of this guy, and we're just going to have to plan around it and make sure we've got the requisite depth to be competitive on the nights when he's not there. Do you think if Elton Brand got a do-over to build this team for this year, 2019-20, he would, have made the, he would make the same exact moves knowing what he knows now? No, I think they do definitely some things a little bit differently. I think you would have seen they may still do the Al Horford deal because I think now you're going to start to see the value of Al Horford with Embiid on the shelf for a little bit. And I think that was kind of always the idea there is we're getting a starting power forward and we're in effect getting our backup center all in one player and that there is value in that. But I think where you would have seen things go a little bit differently was they might have pushed a little harder to say, all right, we got to finagle things, but we're going to do what we can to make sure J.J. Reddick stays here. We're going to maybe get interested in doing sign-in trades to add talent to this roster versus seeing guys just go. And I think they would have approached the bench uh, differently as well to make sure we've got a good quality third backup in there. I like Kylo Quinn, but for whatever reason, now we're on team three in a row, a uh, year about four or five in a row where he's just not he's just not playing very much. And and I think there's a reason for that. I, well, when it's one time, you think maybe situationally, that's not it. So I think he would have done things a little bit differently around the edges. But the big moves, I think they probably still would have made those because those are the moves that really kind of still, in a lot of ways, still make the most sense. Uh, Keith, uh, Keith Smith, Yahoo Sports covers the NBA. I remember talking to you when they got Horford, and one of the things, I believe it was you that was explaining that, Horford really was excited to get to play the four again. You know, he didn't yep. like being a five in Boston because he's not a great rim protector. He doesn't like having to bang down low, but now he got a chance to play the four in Philly, and that's something he was excited about. Is it working the way that he and you – I don't know. You, you know, you didn't get a chance to ask him this, but do you think it's working the way that he thought it would, getting a chance to play the position that he prefers to play? I think this is a case of the player is always the last one to know when they're not capable of doing something at the level that they did it. And there were some small signs of slippage in Al Horford as a primitive defender, a guy who could get out there and switch. And when you're playing as the five, as he often had to do for the Celtics last couple of seasons, it was not as noticeable because it might only be a handful of times a game. Now where he's spending half his minutes when, when both him and Beat are in the lineup together playing out on the perimeter and defending guys, it just stands out that much more and you start to say, Oh boy, you know, has his game really slipped this much? Whereas you know, he gets beat by somebody off the dribble once or twice a game, not the end of the world. When it's happening four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times a game, you start to be like, Oh, this is maybe not so good. I think I think as far as role goes, I think Horford's signed there knowing Embiid misses time, so they're going to make me play some of the five here. But but his minutes at the four, I think it's one of those where the player is usually the last one to admit to himself, all right, maybe this isn't for me now. i got to start to figure things out and maybe approach them. Because Brett Brown, uh, the, the talk magnifies of him needing to go. But when you look at the offseason, a lot of these problems were predicted. And now when we're in the middle of them, it seemed worse uh, than talking about him before the season starts. So are things better than they appear? And if not, what are the answers? Yeah, I'm not going to say that they're better than they appear. I think Philadelphia is 
when they look good, they look like title contenders. When they look bad, they look like everything we all said wore so The defense is good, but there's definitely places you can attack and those kind of things. I, I don't know what their answers are beyond trying to make trades for guys who fit better. I think what we have seen, especially over really the last month or so, is just how much J.J. Redick meant to them. Even when Redick wasn't shooting the ball a lot or the shots weren't going in, you still had that player who the defense had to bend towards, and they have to account for him. We just They just don't have that guy now. Josh Richardson, you know, was it a week ago, went off on Boston in a big way, but they're all mid-range jumpers. And I think if you're the Celtics, you'd say, hey, we lost, but we lost letting up the shots that we really wanted to allow. This guy didn't go off on us, hitting a bunch of threes, and he wasn't getting to the rim. He was hitting everything from, you know, 10 to 16, 20 feet in that range. So I think that's where it's really tough. Now, when you look at it, there's no clear answer where they go to fix it because to get any kind of you know, major impact move, they're going to have to move on from one of the five starters. Those are the only guys who make enough money to be valuable in trade. What I have to start to wonder is, if well, let's say they really start playing well while Embiid's out and, and Horford is getting a ton at the five. If you have to start and look at it and say, you know what, if we got all this money invested in Horford and beads are big, we could get a whole bunch of stuff for this guy. We we could you know get probably two three rotation players who could help us. Maybe some future assets down the line to he's that good from a team that that bet. Hey, you have to wonder if if they really started to play well. If that's where they start to think. There's no indication that's happening, but you have to you know think that that could be a direction that they could go later. But I think this year it's probably going to be it is what it is. Maybe a minor move or two around the edges for this season but i would think this might be bigger changes to come this coming off season who's the leader in this locker room because you talk about championship dna and all the cliches and there's a lot of basketball things schematically that we talk about every single day but brett brown being one of them what about Embiid? what about ben what about horford is, is there just like a culture or leadership problem that could be not as evident right now yeah, I don't. I don't know that it's a problem because I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that from anybody connected to the team or anybody else who's talked to folks there. It seems to be Horford takes on a more of a quiet leadership. The, the joke in Boston was that he's like the dad, you know, in the room where you know he doesn't say too much. Look, and you know, all right, I shouldn't be doing that. But but beyond that, there there isn't. Anything. Tobias Harris just isn't really that guy. The other guys are all too young. Or in the case of Embiid right now, it's a little hard to be be a leader when you're not on the floor. You know, guys just they, they kind of don't want to hear it from those guys. So so I think it's Horford. I know Kylo Quinn has a presence there. But one of the things that I was told was their guy who did a lot of that over the last couple of seasons was Amir Johnson. And Amir Johnson's impact on the court may not have been what people wanted it to be. But off the court, he, he was beloved for the things he did in that locker room as far as keeping guys together, helping the young guys along, and those kind of things. And when you bring in an Al Horford type, He's, he's a good leader and he's a great teammate. He's just not going to be that guy who's going to get in somebody's ear and tell them, you know, hey, that's not how we do this if we want to want to go. He's more of a lead-by-example kind of guy. Maybe give the stern look every once in a while and settle it down. So so there probably is a little bit of a lack of leadership, and that does, I think, show up at times when, when things kind of get going the wrong way and say, all right, it's on me now. You listen here. Here's how we're going to get through this. Keith, just a few minutes ago, Brett Brown was doing a press conference and he doubled down on something he's continued to say. He wants his team to shoot more three-pointers. Right now, they're 25th in the league in three-point attempts per game, and that makes, or their percentage, they hover around the middle depending on whether they're on a, a hot streak or a cold streak. When you hear the coach say that and you look at the personnel that they have, you think what? Yeah, do you want to take because I mean, we know he came out recently and challenged Ben Simmons. I want you to shoot at least. Well, I think we even might have talked about it on this show. Simmons isn't going to do that. We, we have enough evidence now that that's not going to happen. Now you called your guy out, said, did it. He, he, what does that leave you? What's your recourse as a coach? So it has to be with the personnel. You can say it till you're blue in the face. Guys are going to be fine. You want us taking three pointers? I'm going to I'm going to pull up on fast breaks. So I'm going to I'm going to you know one pass and a shy at the most kind of things, and that that may be not what's best for you because that becomes a little bit of a challenge. I, I know a guy like Tobias Harris. I covered him here in Orlando pretty extensively. I've watched his entire. Okay, that's what you want, Coach. I'll get it. I can get into I can get into a shot. It may not be a good shot, but I'll get a shot up. I'll I'll let let a few fly. Horford 
he this was one of the criticisms at times in Boston where even in nights when he had a favorable matchup inside, he would only hang out around the perimeter. And there were times when it's like, man, I'd like to get that guy inside. And you would say, is that a function of the offense or is that him? Where, where are we at with that? And that's my worry. You challenge your team like this, maybe you want them to play that way. What is what he's saying? Kind of read between the lines here. And I want to shoot more threes. Hey, Elton Brand, go get me guys who can actually shoot and make these threes. Uh, we do hear the Sixers linked to a lot of guys. Uh, Kennard came up. Um, we've seen uh, a number of guys who are kind of in that uh, shooting wing mold. Uh, I, I guess the one question would be, is it smart, Keith, for Elton Brand to flip this roster again in midseason or just try to ride this thing out and hope they click over an 82-game season? Yeah, I think I think for this year, you just got to ride it out. You just got to say, I put this together. I had the belief that... I don't really care what happens in the regular season. We're built to win in the playoffs, and I believe that that's what we're going to do. And if and that's hard because as fans look at it, and, and geez, we're a sixth place team or a fifth place team. We're not even get home in the first round. I think if your belief was this roster is built to win in the playoffs, you have to ride that out. And then if it doesn't work, you can readdress over the summer because if you're going to flip it all through again, at some point the owner is going to be like, all right, we've done this now. Well, what are we doing here? Why are we continuing to do this cycle plan through? If it doesn't work, you readdress this as that that seems to be the best route because you're just continuing to cycle guys through and making major roster changes. That's so hard. And you've really, at that point, kind of go back to what we talked about earlier. You put Brett Brown in an almost impossible position to deliver a really good result. Does it make it difficult for guys like Tobias Harris and Josh Richardson to have success consistently night in, night out. It just feels like it's difficult for them to put the team on their back. Like this is a time where you gave Tobias Harris that contract. Joel Embiid's out. You would love to see him have a couple 30 night games consistently 25 and, you know, get this out Joe. But I just feel like how they run their offense makes it really difficult for him to do that. Yeah, it, it can be really hard on them. Now, I think uh, I'm going to go get, get back to that Boston game. I think having Mike Scott out there in place of Joel Embiid, and I'm not crazy enough to even remotely suggest he's better than Embiid, but when you put him out there, you could see the floor was just spaced better. So when Harris, who, he's, a, he's a good shooter, but his best uh, part of his game is putting the ball on the floor for a couple bounces and getting to the rim. Same thing with Josh Richardson. When they were able to get that and then work into that little bit of space to find their spots, you could see it versus, all right, it took two dribbles and now I'm running into a teammate because Horford and Bede and, and Simmons are all standing in and around the paint. So now all we're, we're all connected and it's all you know junked up inside here. So I think that does make it really hard when the main guys are all there because someone's always in and around the basket area. And then there's another guy usually somewhat fair to that, uh, maybe on the opposite side, maybe around the free throw line or something like that. So so I think you, you've got a good point there. There is definitely something to that. It, sometimes with these with NBA teams, it's, you, it's not about collecting talent. It's not a fantasy roster. It's about finding the right fit of guys and putting them together in the right spots. And sometimes less is more. And sometimes I look at Philadelphia and I'm like, yeah, when they're down a guy, sometimes they do look a little bit better because I think all the pieces start to fit a little bit better. Well, and we were just talking about this before you jumped on with us. Keith Smith, Yahoo Sports covers the NBA is they were criticized. They couldn't beat Milwaukee. They couldn't beat Boston. They couldn't beat Toronto. And they've kind of checked all those boxes off. So it's like everything that they were told they couldn't do, they have done. And it's almost like they're kind of going, what is happening with the Clippers, where they're just like, you know, Kawhi said the other night, ah, have fun. Come check us out. Come playoff time. You know, like it, it feels like they kind of have this attitude, which I don't know that is is good because, as you mentioned, one of the reasons why, you know, we had this little debate about – Ben Simmons is 23 and beats 25. Can you realistically say this is a championship team with such young guys? One of the reasons why young players don't win when the best players also have to be the leaders at that age. They're not ready to be leaders when they're so young. It's not that they're not talented enough. It's that they're not ready to be. And it seems that that's why they're in the sixth spot. Their talent allows them to beat the teams that you say they can't, but their immaturity brings them back to the middle of the pack sometimes. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think what you have happened is stepping up when they need to against the very best teams. Because you can't get up for the big games. You can't be in the league. It, the best teams are the ones who they go on the road and they beat Chicago by 20 points. On a, 
though those are when those teams come. And, and I look at it, and when the Golden State Warriors coast through a regular season, here, well, they've earned that. They, they, we know the most. And we also know, though, as much as we criticize them for coasting, Yet they were still the one seed. They were getting enough wins to, to be at the top of the conference. They might throw the away. And that's the problem, I think, I think with both Philadelphia and, and, and the Clippers. So many peace teams that think, ah, we're just going to flip the switch when it comes playoff time. Clippers, maybe they can get away with that because they've got Kawhi, they've got other veterans who've been there. Maybe they can they can pull that off. We'll see. I even have my doubts with them. But with Philadelphia, you look at it and be like, what have you ever won? You've never won any. You've won a couple playoff series. That's not enough. If if you think you're going to get to the playoffs and you're going to fly, you know, drop in there as the fifth or sixth seed, and all of a sudden you're going to turn it on. Yeah, maybe you went around, but all you've done is make your make your whole path harder, and that that's when it gets really difficult. Because if you were built to be Milwaukee, Boston, Toronto, and you've shown you can do that, the idea was that. Uh, maybe one of them, or maybe two of them at the most. You don't want to have to go through two, three, or two to even get yourself in position to be in the finals. That's when it gets real. The Sixers only get through one round, a lot of chances, including to uh, pass that second round again. Keith Smith, Yahoo NBA, and Twitter, Wednesdays here. Thanks for having me, guys. And Keith Smith, like all guests, here via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline.